All right, let's go ahead and get started. So again, hello everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation titled Introducing Shift Left Educate Security Training for Developers, brought to you by Shift Left. I would like to introduce you to our presenter today, Arun Balakrishnan. Arun has over 13 years of experience in the cybersecurity industry across application, server, web, and endpoint security. He has held positions in engineering, product marketing, and product management, and has worked with organizations including Symantec, Imperva, Trend Micro, and McAfee. And I'd like to pass it off to you, Arun, for the presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar. Um, the topic as was introduced is on Shift Left Educate. Now, the this is a new offering from shift left but more importantly i want to go over what is the problem that we are trying trying to solve for users when we were looking at our customer base doing general research on the application security market in general we often hear people talking about finding every single possible vulnerability in their application stack. And then we started thinking, is that actually a problem or is there a bigger issue at hand? So then we started asking questions of our customers saying, okay, imagine we find all these vulnerabilities, um, how much of them are you fixing today? And this is very specific to application security, right? So this is not um, say operating system vulnerabilities or network vulnerabilities in the rest of their stack. This is specific to the applications that they're developing and deploying in-house. Of the vulnerabilities that you find, how many are you fixing? And across the board, when we got responses, it was pretty spot on that they were fixing less than half that they find. So on one hand, when they keep saying, I need to find every single vulnerability, that is possible. On the other hand, the vulnerabilities that they find are not getting fixed. And there are different pieces in, in play here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> normally, it's the security teams that ask and have the request of saying, yeah, I just cannot let go of a single vulnerability. I need to find all of them. But yeah, at the end, on the other hand, Fixing these vulnerabilities is not generally within the security team. The onus is on the application developers, the dev teams, and they're not just focused on fixing vulnerabilities. They are doing this in addition to all the features and functionalities and, and deployments that they're doing on the, the main product. And even when they do fix a vulnerability, an interesting thing is it takes over three months to fix. Now, by fixing, it's not just making the line of code of change that is required. Fixing has a lot of things involved, right? You can imagine finding it is a puzzle in itself. Once you find it, you're validating it, you're figuring it out. And even if I were to pinpoint the line of code that needs to be fixed, in a big organization, you can imagine right from engineering process perspective, getting it into the sprint cycle, getting it implemented, figuring out who is going to do that implementation, validating it, doing QA, doing staging, and then finally, by the time it gets into production, um, in addition to all the prioritization that would have gone to have make it happen, it often takes a long time to get it fixed. Now, of course, this is an average number, right? Like if there is a super critical issue that is affecting applications in production at huge exposure. Yes, those do get fixed much, quite faster, uh, but on average, it takes quite a long time. So here at Shiftlift, we were thinking, okay, as a code analysis platform, what can we provide to make this process better, right? Uh, yes, we cannot, um, maybe improve like the deployment and the sprint cycles and all of that, that is within the organization. But what is something that a vendor like us can help expedite this process? 
So then we started charting the journey of finding a vulnerability all the way to fixing it from a developer's perspective and from a, a developer DevOps security team perspective. So the first step, of course, is analyzing your application. So code analysis, right, wherein you're submitting the application, you're finding vulnerabilities in it, and how do we make that better? Well, a few things that we have done. Um, so the focus of the webinar is on not those aspects, so I'll quickly go over them. Uh, you're always welcome to um, attend our other webinars or visit our website for more information. Uh, to make code analysis better, we enable customers to better integrate this. Um, we are exceptionally faster than other analysis tools. And then also a core uh, belief that we have is code analysis should be part of a developer workflow. By that, I mean, you as a developer should not be required to go into another platform, learn yet another tool, do extra work in addition to what you're already used to as a workflow in order to have code analysis execute. Right? So say, for instance, if you are in a, you have a code repository of choice, you have a build system of choice, you have an ID of choice. And then when you are making these code changes, when code is getting built, code analysis should be part of that flow. Right? It shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be an extra uh, step that somebody has to manually execute. Second, once you can actually analyze the code, is then to deal with findings. Right? So these are the vulnerability findings that come from the analysis. And for this to be useful, there are a few things required. Right. So one, of course, the biggest complaint that you often hear about code analysis is the accuracy. So false positives, right, where findings are there, but they're not actually not true. The thing that you often don't see is false negatives. And I, I didn't mean you don't see, but it is not visible, right? It's not there in the first place. So you don't see the absence of it. Um, so these are where vulnerabilities that are there, but are not reported and they're not found. So both are equally important. Uh, false positives being visible is a bigger headache for most people where if you're thrown a thousand findings of a simple application, and if the onus is on you to figure out which of them are real, it is painful and you quickly start disliking the solution. The Another part is the feedback loop, right? So this is something we see in big organizations where if, as I mentioned, code analysis is an afterthought, some set of developers as a team work on a feature, make the code changes, it gets into the product. And then say a month later, you get feedback on it saying, hey, these are vulnerabilities in your code. At that point of time, I mean, it's it's very difficult to even find the engineer who write, wrote the code, get them back into the context. Um, yes, you could, like if you're on a Git-based system, Git blame and say, okay, hey, this line of code was made by this developer. So it's, it's their issue. But then they have moved on to other projects. They've maybe moved to different teams. Um, and even as a developer who has written the code, if you get to them a month later, even they don't remember every minute details of the code they wrote. And so it, it takes context switch to get back into that flow of that of algorithm or code that they work on to fix it. And finally is context, right? So whenever I give vulnerability information, it should be context sensitive. Context sensitive in the sense it is very relatable to the code. It shows me where exactly in the code. It gives me context of what's happening before, what is happening after. Um, in most situations we've seen there are code analysis tools which is throw you to a line of code and say, hey, this is vulnerable. And it often doesn't have context of what's happening before and after. And that is another reason why there are false positives, right? So wherein the developer would say, yeah, that looks vulnerable. But if you just were to go up two levels in the stack, 
you would see that I validated the input. So it's not a vulnerability, false positive. Move on to the next one, right? Uh, but if the tool has contact sensitive information, not only is it easier, but it also reduces the, the um, false positive rate of vulnerabilities. So these are things that we've worked on at ShiftLab. Um, our tools are capable of doing these. But then the question then, of course, is what next? So I'm able to analyze your code efficiently, effectively. I'm able to find findings in it. I'm able to get it to the right people at the right time and with high accuracy. And now the developer who was to fix the code has the detail of the vulnerability. And the question is, well, I don't know what this vulnerability means, or I'm not sure what I should be doing to fix this. Um, I don't know why this is a vulnerability in the first place, because I'm not security trained. Right? Um, because the argument from the developer is if I knew of the implications of what I'm writing from a security perspective, I might not have done that in the first place. Right? Yes, if it is a mistake, I can go fix it. But in a lot of cases, what we see is developers are good at the, the logic of the application, getting it to do and solve the use cases that they're trying to solve for. But if they're not security trained, they don't take those basic um, checks in place to ensure those vulnerabilities don't happen. Okay, so the, the resolving part of the vulnerability is where developers run into issues. So then we thought, okay, let, let us go through an exercise with a developer to fix one of these vulnerabilities and, and see what they are running into. So we had this exercise with the developer. I'm, I'm of course, putting it into a slide. So uh, there's more to this of them going through multiple iterations. Uh, but this is kind of summarizes the flow that they went through. So the vulnerability at hand was cross-site scripting. Right? So obviously, they, the first thing they did was go on a search engine, search for what is cross-site scripting. And as you can see, 5 million results. Right? Like, where do I get started? Do I start reading? Do I start watching videos? Do I uh, look at code examples? Do I go to a forum like Stack Overflow? There's like so many options out there that it's very easy to get lost. And also remember, if a developer is out there trying to really learn about cross-site scripting, is spending time on it, is looking at it from a learning opportunity. Yeah, maybe they, I mean, they easily can spend a day or multiple days on specific vulnerabilities. I also multiply that by the number of programming languages that they want to write in. Uh, so it's a, it's a big exercise. But in our experience, the situations that developers find themselves are, they're already on a sprint or a cycle of development, whatever process they follow. And then on top of that, so for that cycle, they have certain items to meet. On top of that, they are being asked to fix these vulnerabilities. Right? So they're trying to squeeze it in into the sprint or into the cycle they are on. So they do not have the luxury of going through a day or multi-day training on just one type of vulnerability to be an expert in it. In fact, we've had these questions come up saying, like, is there a silver bullet for these vulnerabilities? Um, unfortunately, no, right? I mean, if there was, then it would have been very easy. Like, we've also had questions saying, is there a button I can click on to fix a vulnerability? I mean, that, that just doesn't exist. There are, again, it's context sensitive. You need to know what the application is doing. Um, even if, say, you think like, okay, for this vulnerability, you need to validate the input. There are many ways of doing it. We've seen organizations where they've developed their own in-house validation methods, which they require their developers to use so that there's a consistency. Uh, so there's no silver bullet answer to fixing a vulnerability. So going back to this flow, right? So the developer started with what is cross-site scripting. That is a huge um, set of options to go into. So then they tried narrowing it down, saying, okay, hey, let's be very specific. They were faced with a cross-site scripting in Java and they were asked to fix it. So obviously, how to fix cross-site scripting in Java? 
Now that that is more manageable. I mean, still 200,000 results, but not 5 million. And when we were, so this is a, a screenshot of the first page of results from their findings. And one thing that stood out to me when I was looking over their shoulder was the second option that came up. It is the first page on Google for this finding for that particular user. And this was the second listing on that page. Now I say for that user, because I mean, when you search for it, the results might be um, based on like maybe a search history or whatever. But for when at that point, when I took a screenshot, this was the second result. And this result caught the eye of the developer as well. Now, why did it catch that eye? Well, one, it says using something to fix cross-site scripting in your Java code. Right? It looks very prescriptive, right? It is, oh yeah, this looks like it'll solve my problem. And then it also says OASP's ES API framework. Right? OASP, okay, the customer, the, the developer is like, oh yeah, that I'm familiar with, sounds more legitimate now. And they went down that route. But I knew of this uh, framework before, uh, speaking to our security engineers in, in ShiftLift. And also there are some things that might stand out from this result, right? So one is it's from 2012, that it's already eight years old. Um, so that could have been an indication that maybe that is outdated. Um, but the developer didn't notice that part. They went on to explore that. Um, and when they read this article, they felt like, yeah, this is the solution. And, and it's a very quick fix to put it in. But then I pointed them to something from OASP, wherein if you were to go to the OASP website for this particular API, there is detailed information, but this part is very relevant wherein they say, if you're using this to solely remediate cross-site scripting, stay away and use the OS Java encoder project instead. Right? There is some history to this, right? There's the ES API uh, is not purpose-built for this. The, I believe that is not being actively maintained anymore. There is a better project out there which can do, do better encoding. Um, but you can see the flow here, right? So wherein, I went and I searched for something. I think I found the silver bullet I was looking for. But if I had cared to look a bit more in detail, I would have realized that is misleading. That is actually not a good solution. So it's clearly not easy to find quick solutions to vulnerabilities. And that, that's obvious. And a, a lot of engineers when we talk to them, they, uh, especially from security, they're like, oh yeah, fixing a vulnerability, like finding is difficult, fixing is easy. But then when we started looking at the metrics that I showed you in the beginning, that's not the case. Right? They're finding a lot, they're not fixing as much. And then when we talk to developers who are tasked with fixing it, we realize, yeah, fixing it is not easy. Yes, I could maybe put a fix in, fold the engine and move on, but it's going to come back and bite us later. So that is not accurate. That's not ideal either. So reliability is key here, right? Getting reliable information is tough. And what, and from your experience, I think you would agree where most developers, they go to these forums, they look for, okay, what is that first solution? Even if there is a Q&A forum, like say Stack Overflow, if you don't read through all the responses, and if you just go with like the first response, you often might be being misled. Right? So searching for quick fixes and the, the pains or the, the problems related to it. The, the second is the context switch, right? It's expensive and frustrating. When a developer has to, you know, leave the code um, analysis process, they have to go find a solution go down a rabbit hole and then come back and, and fix it, that is painful. And then also the, the lack of knowledge which is leading to all of these, right? So uh, most developers are not security trained or at least that is not their core competency or that is not what was their thing that were trained on first. And when you're, they're asked to being asked to fix a vulnerability, often they do not know the 
the vulnerability in general, they do not know the impact of it. Uh, so even when they were putting a fix in place, they're not very sure if that is the right fix. Right? They, they would rather go for something which the engine agrees with um, versus doing the right thing. So we realized, okay, while developer training is important, not all developer training is equal. Right? You need something that is context sensitive and you need that something that is comprehensive. So that, that is the only way developers would use it. Right? When we were looking at code analysis and improving that, we realized that it should be within the workflow, it should be highly accurate, it should not impede on custom uh, developer productivity, it should be fast enough. So those were the issues that we were solving there. Similarly with developer training, being context sensitive and being comprehensive is what we narrowed down on. So let's let's see what comp context sensitive could mean, right? So if this is something where it should be right there when you're looking at fixing a vulnerability, right? So if I am saying, okay, hey, I'm in this application of mine, I have this vulnerability that we identify is valid and needs to be fixed. And this la this application is in this programming language and it's of this vulnerability type, this OS category, this CWE number. I need information specific to that situation. Right? Uh, so we'll, we'll see a demo of, of, of this in action. Um, and then I can walk you through that in more detail. And the next thing is it needs to be comprehensive. Comprehensive, this is more from um, a security team, right? Wherein, yes, developers are looking at specific vulnerabilities at specific points of time to fix it. But the bigger goal is to have developers trained where they don't make the mistake in the first place. Right? Like if that mistake did not exist, you don't need to fix it. Um, um, so if the developer was trained and if the developer knew how to write better code, well, then this vulnerability wouldn't have been there in the first place. You wouldn't have to find it. You wouldn't have to triage it. You wouldn't have to go look for training and then go fix it. So, so this uh, ability to roll out training across the board, assigning courses to a specific group of engineers, um, getting them to complete it, tracking them, maybe align it with their key objectives for you know, the quarter or the year, um, and then also ability to get certifications, right? So this could be tied to your learning program. This could be tied to credits that you get within the organization. Uh, so all of that from a security program perspective, so that uh, this is more uh, foundational and, and solid, um, in addition to point in time, just in time help for developers. So let's go into a, a demo of, of this in action. So what I have here, let me see if this is seeing the right thing. Yeah, okay. So let me quickly go over um, the shift left product, um, our core product, the next generation static analysis, uh, before I get into the, the details of the vulnerability and, and shift left educate. So ShiftLift is a code analysis uh, platform. Uh, you can learn more at shiftlift.io. Our core product, our flagship is next generation static analysis. Now, why we why do we call it next gen static analysis? So if I were to go into, um, okay, right. So this is my GitHub repo. Uh, this is public. You guys can see this as well uh, if you want to go look for it. So this is a, a demo application, right? Shift left Java demo. And the reason I'm showing this is, this is where we integrate into your applications, right? So for instance, if I see these pull requests here, the customer tried making um, a, a file, a change, right? So here I have made some change here. And you can see that right here shift left analysis failed now the analysis didn't fail what we failed is saying hey you've made some change which has vulnerabilities in it right and then hence we are failing 
now let's see the details i believe um yeah right so here it says like okay hey there is um uh, new findings there are vulnerabilities that uh, you have introduced and hence this is failing now let me show you maybe another example which i have this one oh yeah there you go right so shiftler found vulnerabilities that violate policy go here for more details and it said hey this was failed and these checks should pass before you merge the code. Right? So this is what I was talking about workflow, right? Wherein as a developer, when I'm making changes to my application, if I can get immediate feedback on any new vulnerabilities that I have introduced, that is usable. And one thing you can see here is this all happened in two minutes, right? So I made a file change or I made like a pull request, I go get a cup of tea or coffee or whatever whatever and i come back to my desk and i've got immediate feedback saying hey this is an issue look at this and also if you see i mean i'm using github as a repo and this is true for all code repos like you can assign reviewers you can assign checks now if i get feedback in two minutes even the code reviewer that needs to review my change wouldn't have gotten to this so as a developer, I get the opportunity to fix my vulnerabilities before it goes to peer review for in terms of code quality and, and, and uh, functionality review. And so it's immediate feedback. Now, what would be my user experience to look at these vulnerabilities? So at that point, what I would do is I would get an interface like this. So this is our shift left interface. Um, I only have one application, so let me go into another application here, right? So this analysis um, was a latest run on this application, and it is fully aware of um, the branch information and everything that is coming in from GitHub. It is aware of the version information that is coming in from my repo or CI system. and it then tells me that, hey, compared to the previous analysis, there are 12 new vulnerabilities, there are two regressions, you have fixed 33 vulnerabilities. So it gives you detailed information of your journey in fixing vulnerabilities, right? So it, it gives you like trend chart over time, where are you at any point in time and how are you compared to where you were? Now, um, so, so that is related to vulnerabilities. And of course, there are all the information where it like breaks it down by type of vulnerabilities. You can assign it to other users. If you use tools like Jira, you can integrate it into a platform. So you can send off these vulnerabilities to specific engineers in your organization and track it there. Um, or you can track it very well here, right? So if these two are regressions, you're like, okay, this vulnerability was fixed at some point of time, it's come back. Um, you can see if there are some old comments or you can comment, you can assign it to other people in the system. This is just my org, so only I exist, but other people can be here. You can assign it to them. Um, and you can do all those tracking and, and everything within the platform. Um, so that is in terms of the static analysis. Now let's go into the the issue at hand fixing these vulnerabilities right so let me open up a common example so i have web goat here right so this is a, a purposefully vulnerable application i've used the java version of web goat so this is a java application and let's go into a specific vulnerability so sql injection right? so here it has enough information saying hey, i have four sql injection findings all of them are critical um, they're all CVSS score nine, so pretty critical. They're all under the CWE category 89, so common web exploit 89, and they're all OS A1 type. Right? So this much information I have, and then once I click into it, we give you full data flow analysis of the vulnerability, right? Saying, hey, on line number 56, in this Java file, in this variable inside this method in this route is where your flow starts 
And why this is important is this is a user ID field, right? So this is something that the user is inputting on this um, endpoint. And so this is attacker controlled input. And then it is flowing through your code. It is going through all these transforms and functions and everything. And at the end, inside this Java file, you have a query statement on line number 69, where the input from the user is getting executed as a SQL statement inside execute query. It is first parameter, parameter zero. And so it's touching the database, right? So an attacker controlled input is coming all the way into a SQL statement. So a classic example of SQL injection. Now, like people who know about SQL injection, understand this off the bat, right? I've given the data flow. They're like, yeah, this makes total sense. I just need to figure out where to put the check in place. I can do multiple things, right? I mean, you could parameterize the query, you could validate the input. There are multiple things that you can do. Um, some organizations have prescriptions for their developers, they could follow that. Uh, and then with this information, you also know where to go put the fix. fix. I've not linked my repo to this. Uh, let me show you another example. So maybe this one, if I were to go into say cross-site scripting or any vulnerability here. Um, okay, let's see. Maybe I've linked this one. Okay, I'm trying to find an application where I've linked my source code repo. And what that will happen is um, I can then jump into the code itself. Yep, I've linked it here, right? So here you see these links are becoming hyperlinks. Now, when I click on this, it should immediately take me to the line of code in my repo where the vulnerability is, right? So I can, I can flow, I can click through. So it's line number five in this file, I get line number nine, and then I can click and follow up in the code, and then you can fix it there. Um, you might have the question like, hey, hey, why can't I just show the code here? Uh, we do not take your source code into our systems, right? Everything runs on your premises. On your premises, meaning in this situation, it is GitHub, and you're using we are using GitHub Actions to run. So it is all happening within your repo environment. Uh, we do not take the source code back into us. Um, we only take metadata, right? So for that, I knew that in this line, in this file on this line number is the vulnerability, but I do not have full source code to show you. That's why we, we stop at this point, right? So this is the metadata saying, hey, I have this much information with me. I can point you there uh, and I can show you, right? So like when I click on this, it's saying, okay, hey, there is request, response, line number five, image lookup. So I have that much information. So, so that was also possible, right? So that is um, the um, how you go about looking at vulnerabilities. Now let's get into the, the educate part. So let's go into applications. I was on web go. So let's see this example. Go back to the SQL injection vulnerability that I was on. Um, so here, right? So this vulnerability. Now we looked at this. We said, okay, user ID going into database, vulnerable, we understand. But what if the developer doesn't know what SQL injection is? If you want a quick reminder, we have a description tab here where we say that, hey, attacker control data is used in a SQL query without escaping or validation. Simple, if you knew these things, it's like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. It refreshes my memory, I can take over. Um, you say that, hey, you can do prepared statements, um, parameterize your query. So these are examples of how to approach it, that's good. We have linked to CWE and OASP information if you want to get up-to-date information from these um, forums that you have. So these are maintained by the OASP project, right? So it, they give clear definition of um, examples of how to do this. So that is also good, but this is also, some of these are not very language specific, right? So these are like more from an outside in perspective at times. So this is information. 
And what we're introducing newly with Shift Left Educate is this button here saying security training. Now let's see the experience. So as a developer, I'm here, right? So this is web code in Java, vulnerability type of SQL injection. When I click on security training, it opens up a new tab. Um, do this, I'm on a full account. So it was asking me to sign in, there you go. Right? So it opens up a new tab and it takes me exactly to the vulnerability type in the programming language I am interested in. And this is full-fledged training, right? So you can see there's 19 pages of it, starting from an example of how this vulnerability happens in real life, the backend code, how you can modify that code, how you can detect the injections, multiple ways of um, looking at it, some more vulnerable code and mitigation steps, right? And it's fully detailed and it is, uh, it is a hands-on kind of training, right? So wherein like you can read, like it has some description, you go in, you're like, okay, hey, you're getting this email. There is this link and you're like, okay, having reviewed this, they're like, okay, I want to unsubscribe. So you click on unsubscribe. You're like, okay, hey, enter this email ID there. So I do, okay, I paste that email ID, click on submit, and then we are tracking what the HTTP request is. We can see that information. You can analyze the request. It gives you information on that. So it's very, very detailed, hands-on, outside, in, and also inside out, because after this, it'll go into the code um, kind of information. And now this is not just specific to SQL injection, right? Obviously, when I go back, um, and if I were to go into Java, it has all the other kinds of training, right? So there's cross-site scripting, force browsing, uh, cross-site scripting in multiple types, right? There's reflected, there is stored. Um, there's all these types of vulnerabilities that you have full-fledged training on. And this is specific to languages as well, right? So here, what we are seeing is Java. You have Java here, and then of course you have all the other languages as well. Right? Um, and then um, further going down, there's also like API specific training for Java. Right? So if I go in here, it's more of like improper assets management, data exposure, uh, object level authorization, very specific to API kind of use cases. Right? So this is the, the training uh, capability. Now, at the same time, um, we have also launched um, another portal, right? So there is um, Shift Left Learn. Um, it's just learn.shiftleft.io. Right? And this is an example. Um, and we are also offering the free courses here. This doesn't even require you to sign up to access this, right? So if I just say start course, it just takes you to a course directly, right? It doesn't even require you to log in or anything at this point. And it starts giving you training um, on cross-head scripting in Java. Right? And the beauty of this training is it, um, you, you can also get a, a free shift left account. Uh, I'll, I'll walk you through that. And it is hands-on from a code perspective, right? Where the examples that I was showing you, it uses those ex same exact examples. So it points you to saying, hey, go into this repo. You find cross-head scripting in shift left, make these changes in your code. You'll see those vulnerabilities go away. And so it's hands-on training. You fix the vulnerability. You immediately see the impact. You see that the vulnerability is gone. You can try fixing other vulnerabilities and, and you learn through the process. So, so that's how this is structured. Uh, let me go back into the training and again, um, specify how to get there. Okay. So to get started, um, two ways, uh, both kind of get to the same place. One is learn.shiftlift.io, you can go there. Uh, we have, uh, we just launched this yesterday, right? So you have five courses there, cross-head scripting, deserialization, uh, RCE, sensitive data and directory traversal, all on Java to start with. Um, so these give you hands-on training with demo applications, and as I said, you can change code, you can fix it, you can see the effect immediately. Um, 
yeah, as part of this, or you can separately sign up as well. Uh, there is a free account with Shiftlift, um, and it's free as in free. Right? There's, there's no um, like there's no credit card required. All it takes is signing up with GitHub or giving us your email and and password. Um, and once you sign up, you get the the full Shiftlift product. Um, the um, you you can upgrade. There are some features which are premium, um, but to perform basic analysis on your repositories, um, this account is uh, more than sufficient. And and it has the feature that I mentioned. It can integrate into your pull request. Uh, we even have a single click um, EC deployment for GitHub repositories. Uh, let me let me show you the experience. What you would see, right? So so when you come in and you were to say add app, we'll say hey. If you are on GitHub, uh, or if you do have a GitHub account, give us access to um, your repository. And then we have all these sample applications that you can use uh, to try out. And this is the same sample application. So in Java, there's a demo app. The same Java demo app that is used within the free training uh, that is on this site uh, to go through the training. Right? Um, and then you can also see the other parts of the product. You can experience all the other aspects. So that is how you can get started. Let me see if I had anything more to cover. Um, no, that was pretty much it. Um, yeah, let, let me see what questions are coming in. Okay, good. A lot of questions coming in. Uh, that's good. Okay, so question is what Secure coding and what's the benefit of integrating this into um, the developer workflow? So, yeah, so, so secure coding, I mean, vulnerabilities are because applications are written in an insecure way, right? So, going back to this example, um, so if I were to pick, um, sorry, web code, so it's an easier example to follow. Um, so, you SQL injection again. The the secure coding would be when a developer understands that okay, I am taking an input from a user. This user could be an attacker, and this is attacker controlled input, understanding those terminologies. This is my source, this is where it starts. These are all my transforms, these are all where the code is flowing in my application, and this is my sync, this is where the code ends. And this is a SQL statement. And linking all of these, an attacker controlled input without validation ends up in a SQL query, is a SQL injection possible attack vector, um, is the training that we are trying to um, impart. Right? And then if you know this, and if it's part of your, um, like part of how you write code, the idea is these mistakes won't be committed again. And so you wouldn't have to deal with these vulnerabilities. And the benefit of having this in the workflow is we've seen, and, and this is common for, for most people, that when you get immediate feedback, the chances of you learning is higher, right? Um, so when I make a mistake, if I were to get immediate feedback, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Let me fix it. And the next time when I'm doing it, chances are higher that I wouldn't make that mistake. So that's why being it in the workflow is uh, very critical. Um, okay, so questions around static analysis. Can the speed of the vulnerability check be improved? Um, and can we set profiles to restrict the list? Okay, so first question, can the speed be improved? Um, so as I mentioned, compared to other vendors, we are anywhere up to like 40 times faster. Um, so this is based on real life tests that we have done with customer workloads. Um, we can do, say on our website, there are the numbers quoted like a million lines of code in less than 15 minutes. Most applications are not that big. Um, a few hundred thousand lines of code we do, do in few minutes. And so the few minutes part was critical for us to accomplish because if that is not true, then the workflow integration doesn't happen, right? Like if you make a pull request and then you say that, hey, 
code analysis is going to take like two hours, that is a non-starter. Uh, as I said, like make a change, go get something to drink, come back, you get results. That gets used. The other one doesn't get used. And we've seen organizations where they schedule scans overnight, they schedule scans over the weekend, uh, hoping and praying that it completes by the time they come back. Um, that is not used on the long term. Right? Those solutions uh, end up being used as a checkbox. They scan for the for the sake of scanning. Uh, it is not something that you um, adopt and incorporate. All right, so that is why speed is critical. Um, can we set profiles or restrict the list of vulnerabilities pertinent to our organization? Yes, you definitely can. Um, in our analysis, um, so let me open up uh, docs.shiftlift. Uh, this is all public information, right? Our docs is completely public. So you can go here and, and see um, what it can, what we can do. Um, so there is all these things. So I think this is relevant to what you were saying. Saying, okay, for this particular application, or maybe for your entire organization, you're only interested in certain types of vulnerabilities, you can easily do that. Um, and then you can also tweak it saying, hey, um, I have in-house validation sanitization methods. If those are in the path, don't treat it as a vulnerability. So all of those things are also possible, right? So here like sanitization in source code, so things like SQL injection can be avoided. If a developers are already doing it, those vulnerabilities should not be uh, surfaced. Yes. Um, is it on-premise or web hosted? So there are two components to our analysis. Um, as I mentioned, we never take source code out of your premises. <clears throat> so in that sense, um, there is a very lightweight command line utility that runs within your pipeline. Uh, by pipeline, I mean wherever your CI system is, right? So uh, Jenkins, Circle CI, GitHub Actions, um, any 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 CI system out there. I haven't seen one that we don't integrate into because it's very straightforward, um, and that's how we integrate. Now. Um, yeah, so that part runs on your premises. And then what that does is it takes your application, converts it into what we call as a code property graph. And that is what is sent to us for analysis. And now code property graph, um, say for instance, this example, right, WebGoat, the Java package of WebGoat is around 85 megabytes in size, if I remember correctly. And our code property graph is six megabytes. So it's less than 10 percentage in size. So I mean, that's very obvious and clear. We are not taking the code. We are just taking the data flow required for us to do analysis. Uh, if you want to leave, read more on what we do, you can go to our uh, technology page. And this is what I'm referring to, the code property graph. Uh, so this is the example, right? For this piece of code, these are the graphs that get created. This is a simplified version of it and this is how that graph would look like and this is what we take and right? so we're not taking your complete code and the whole white paper is here right if you want to see full details on what is happening uh, you're more than welcome to read that so that is it so so that part is cloud right so the analysis on our side is cloud-based SaaS based uh, on your premise, it is wherever your CI system is. So it's, if it's on-prem CI, it works. If it's cloud-based CI, it works. We really don't care. And uh, all you need to do is have an external going connection to send the CPG to us, right? We don't even do uh, ingress, it's just egress. Okay. Um, is there an integration with GitLab? Good question. Um, so, what we do today, if you go into this and you go into developer workflows, uh, we've done documentation for the, the big players, the more the common ones that we see among our customer base. Uh, so that is this list. So GitHub is one of them. 
and this gives you line by line instructions on how to integrate us into the GitLab merge request workflow, right? Um, so like the tokens that you need to set, the API tokens that you need to create, where you can go enable these things within GitHub, uh, the YAML configuration file that is required on our side, on GitLab side, um, and that's it. And then you configure rules if you want to break your build, and you pull push these files into GitLab, and it just starts working, right? So in GitLab, in your CI CD as a job, we would get invoked. Um, so yes, so we totally integrate into GitLab, um, GitHub, Bitbucket, Travis, Bamboo Jenkins, all of these um, we integrate. And as I mentioned, um, I mean, it's very straightforward. I mean, you can even run it on your own laptop, right? So um, if you go into the install, you can see that you can set it up on your own laptop. You don't even need a CI system. Um, and we run on Linux, Mac, and Windows, right? So all major platforms. Uh, and it's very straightforward. So on, on Linux, it's pretty much like get the binary, authenticate it if you don't use variables, and then you just execute it, right? That's it. It's, it's that easy. Um, let's see. Can we integrate with other collaboration tools? Uh, so yes, all of our information on the UI, ex everything that you see on the UI is available over API. Right? So this is our API documentation. Um, you can see that everything that you see on the UI, comparing scans, listing everything, reading it, even the history of it at the org level, the summary level, uh, specific to like find all the apps, find all the branches, every single thing that you see on the ui is available over epi so yes it can be integrated into pretty much any system out there we have customers who have in-house build systems where they integrate it in, us into right uh, so yes it can be um let's see i think i have time for a couple more questions uh let me see please um can you can you show the the organizational wide capabilities sure so so in in shift left educate right um so in inside um shift left educate what we have is um so if you're a paid customer you get the admin view and in this admin view, you get those tools and capabilities that I mentioned, right? So wherein you can say that, okay, purchase a set of licenses. These are what I've used. Um, how much time is our users spending on these? I can see what are the courses that people are taking, how many have started, how many have finished it, um, so that I can um, use this information um, for my organization, right? So if I'm assigning courses to people, I can track all of these here. Um, at the same time, all of these can also be exported and used in reporting as well. Right, so, so that information is all available. Okay. Um, okay. Does your <clears throat> static analysis do um, secrets detection? Okay. Yep. That's a good question. Uh, let me show that here. Okay. So if I were to go into an application, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, I think this one has some secret findings. Um, so yes, so as part of the static analysis with the same underlying foundation that we have, the code property graph, we can do way more things, right? So secret detection is one of them, right? So this is vulnerabilities. At the same time, we can also show secrets, right? So here in this example, um, this is a sample application, this key is not valid, but this key is, I mean, it looks like it is a valid key format uh, for our AWS. So what this has done is in this file, in my code base, this key was found and hence we have detected it and this is also reported, right? So people can then, you know, figure out like, do I need to invalidate the key? Has it gone into my history? Uh, what are the impacts? Uh, and then this is also part of educating developers as to why this is a bad, I mean, it's not even a bad practice. It, it definitely shouldn't even be done. Uh, and then educate them on 
how to go about uh, managing keys. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so we do do secret detection as well. I think that is about time. Uh, there are a few more questions. Um, I'll, I'll get these over um, email so I can um, get them uh, answered. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to attend. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, let me open up the slide where you can do the next steps. So these are the ones. Um, yep, uh, so learn.shiflab.io or shiflab.io forward slash register. Uh, this is where you can get started for yourself. Um, at this point, uh, let me pass it on back to DZone. Great, thank you Arun for that phenomenal presentation. DZone is very grateful to have had you present to our audience today. Um, secondly, DZone would also like to thank ShiftLab for providing the audience with this great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, everyone.